Okay, I have notes and I also have a timer, so I shouldn't, yeah, every preacher should have one, right? <laughs> okay, name some things you love. I'll go first. Uh, football, sushi. Uh, Fiona, what do you love? Okay, bird song and cogs. Anyone else? Your wife, excellent answer. Who else? Salted caramel ice cream. That's a, a really good call. But I would argue pralines and cream is maybe even better. Anyone else? What do you love? Sorry? Dark chocolate. Interesting. And you said? Oh, okay. Oh, there must be something you love. <laughs> Seaside is a great answer. All right. Okay, Neil. Sorry, Fiona. Curry. Oh, man, that's a good answer. We just got back from, from two weeks in Kefalonia, a Greek island. Uh, really good food, but I realized when I came home I was desperate for curry. So almost the first thing I did was cook four curries. The, the, the day after we got home, I made um, chicken dan sack, a uh, sarg chicken, uh, prawn korma, and uh, du piazza. Because I, I really missed my curry, I realized that. It's the national dish of England, isn't it? And when you're away from England, you need good English food like curry. So there are some things that we love. All right, here's an obvious question. What should we love? Yeah, exactly, yeah, Jesus. We should love God. Interesting. And yet we listed all these other things. <laughs> Let's read some very familiar words. This is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22. An expert of the law tested Jesus with this question. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, it's interesting how often you talk to people, they like to jump straight to the second half of that. Especially when you talk to non-Christians and they say, oh, you know, I might not be a Christian, but I respect the wisdom of the teaching of Jesus, that the most important thing is to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says it's the second most important thing. The most important thing is to love God himself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now my question for you this morning is, when you hear this, does that feel like a joyful thing to you? Or, when in fact you're thinking about salted caramel ice cream in the seaside, does it feel a little bit like a burden, like an obligation? that, oh, no, we shouldn't be loving all these things. We should be loving God instead. Oh, dear, how badly we're doing. Do you have, is, is there a little bit of a sense of that? So loving God doesn't always feel easy. And the reason is that he's not right here in front of us to see and taste and smell like we do with a curry. It's easy to love a curry because it's right there in front of you. You can inhale the aromas. You can taste the tastes, obviously. Yeah. But God, in that sense, is distant. There's another sense in which he's very close to us all the time. But there's, there's, you know, the reality is, I can't reach out and grab hold of him. It's difficult. And then there's this. Second letter to Timothy, Paul complains. He writes, Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. So then it seems like loving this world is a bad thing. In fact, very early in my Christian life, I became a Christian in a, a brethren church, and they had a little magazine called Believer's Magazine. Does anyone else remember that? This would have been in the 80s. And I, I remember there was an article in there whose title was Having Loved This Present World. And it was all about Demas, the guy mentioned in this verse, and about how loving this present world draws us away from God. Which means, you might think, that all those curries and ice creams and dark chocolates and whatever diabetic people eat, that all those things are going to draw us away from God. Can that be right? Is that right? Well, the thing is, we're made, I think, to love the things in this world. 
So you would have to say, is there a contradiction there? God has made us the way we are, and it's in our nature to love good food and good drink and enjoyable ways of spending our time. So I think the issue here is not that we shouldn't love all these things, and I'm going to argue shortly that we very much should love them all, but that we need to love God more than we love these other things. Or to put it another way, to love the giver more than we love the gifts. But how are we going to do that? Well, one path is that we should try to love these other things less so that how much we love God is more than that. So here's how we would do this. We would enjoy our food less, maybe by eating um, Rivita instead of real food. Or, or Probably someone loves Rivita out here. Um, what food does no one like? Oh, tofu. Right, we could... Uh, we could <laughs> don't tell me someone here loves tofu. Oh, okay. Um, uh, beetroot. No one likes beetroot, do they? Oh. Um, all right, poison. Who likes eating po- Okay. So we could make ourselves enjoy food less by eating food that we like less. Or we could enjoy our work less by doing work that we don't like. Or those of us who are married, we could enjoy our marriages less by not spending time with our spouse or by becoming sarcastic and bitter with them. Do these seem like good ideas? Right, so this can't be the answer. It can't be that the way to love God more than the things of this world is by loving these things less. And the reason that's not the answer, and this is really my key point here, is that every good thing that we enjoy in this earth is good because it's a gift from God. It's a gift of God that comes from him because of his generosity and also that reveals to us something of his character. Now, if you don't believe me, you might believe these people. Uh, The Apostle James writes, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. Now, that means salted caramel ice cream. And if you don't believe James, you might believe John, who writes, Through Christ, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. See, it all comes from God. And that means the seaside. And if you don't believe John, you might believe Paul, who wrote to Timothy. And this is a verse I used last time I was preaching here, if you may remember. God, it says, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. What a rich verse that is. You know, it's not, just, it's not just saying, he could have said, God who gives us everything that we need. That would have been true, but he's saying much more than that. He's saying God gives us for our enjoyment. And feel the texture of this passage from Psalm 104. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for people to use. You allow them to produce food from the earth, wine to make them glad, or in some translations, wine that makes glad the heart of man. Olive oil to soothe their skin and bread to give them strength. Now, do you feel that the writing of that is not just a statement of God gives us the things we need to live? It's talking about an abundance, a generosity, a goodness of life. It's not just stuff you can eat that'll keep you going. It's, it's fresh, crusty bread. It's olive oil. It's wine. So God is not just about supplying our needs, but also about feeding our senses because God wants to bless us. He makes life not just a matter of survival, but of living. So for that reason, we very much don't want to love God's gifts less And all the things that we listed at the beginning and that I've come back to from time to time, I feel that we very much should enjoy those and recognize them as being what they are, as being gifts from God. So if God has given us all these things to enjoy, and that's his intention, does it mean that actually we're free to go our own way uh, and just enjoy the things we enjoy and call it done? No, it doesn't. And I'm going to tell you why in the words of the only major 20th century Christian writer who was named after a kind of office supplies. And I'm referring, of course, to uh, C.S. Lewis, 
whose S stands for Staples. And if you don't believe me, you can look that up. It's true. His middle name is Staples. Clive Staples Lewis, in an essay titled First and Second Things, writes this. The woman who makes a dog the center of her life loses in the end not only her human usefulness and dignity, but even the proper pleasure of dog keeping. The man who makes alcohol his chief good loses not only his job, but his palate and all power of enjoying the earlier and only pleasurable levels of intoxication. It is a glorious thing to feel for a moment or two that the whole meaning of the universe is summed up in one woman. Glorious so long as other duties and pleasures keep tearing you away from her. But clear the decks and so arrange your life, it is sometimes feasible, that you will have nothing to do but contemplate her and what happens. Of course, he says, this law has been discovered before, but it will stand rediscovery. It may be stated as follows. Every preference of a small good to a great, or a partial good to a total good, involves the loss of the small or partial good for which the sacrifice is made. Apparently, the world is made that way. You can't get second things by putting them first. You can get second things only by putting first things first. Does it make sense? So in Lewis's understanding of this, which I share, absolutely we enjoy all the second things, but we get them and we enjoy them to the fullest by focusing first on first things. And compared with God himself, of course, everything else is a second thing. So my enjoyment of a really good pint of beer is enhanced when I am closer to God. And that's not just a bit of theology I believe in, it's my experience as well. So, the bad news you might like to think is that you can't get health or wealth or love or any of the things that we want from life by putting those things first. And that even if you do somehow attain them, uh, you don't fully enjoy them, you won't really grasp them and hold them and feel the goodness of them if you've done that by having them ahead of God himself. You can only fully enjoy something when you enjoy it in the light of the goodness of God. So that's the bad news, but the good news is very, very good that comes with that. The positive counterpart of the same thing is this. When we recognize something that we love as being a second thing, what Lewis called a second thing, when we recognize it as a gift from God, in other words, two things happen that are both very good. One of them is we enjoy the gift itself more. The more we understand something as being a gift of God, as being a manifestation of his goodness and his kindness and his generosity, the more we enjoy it for itself. But the other thing that happens is we more fully appreciate God as the giver of those gifts. So as we enjoy all these other things, when we understand what they are, when we understand that they're gifts of God, when we understand that they're second things and not first things, what happens is that we more deeply understand and more deeply love the God who gave them to us. So let me give you some examples. Uh, I mentioned marriage, um, or any family relationship really, is among other things a celebration of the fact that God has made us relational beings, has given us the ability to relate together and for a group of us or a pair of us to be more than the sum of the parts. Work that we do for our jobs is a celebration of a sort of dignity that God has given us, of allowing us to be co-workers with him and of contributing to our own lives and the lives of those around us. Football, I mentioned earlier, is among other things, it's a celebration of the fact that there's, there's something generous, I think, about using your, your physicality and your skills and your time to do something that has no real meaning. And although I love football, I know it, it, it doesn't matter. That's part of the joy of it. You know, I can watch a game and be deeply embedded in it and at the end of it just say, oh, it was only a game because it's just something that you generously throw your time and energy into in much the same way on some level that God just generously throws his time and energy and resources into us. Uh, and food and drink, of course, I've, I've touched on a lot because 
when I asked you all what you love, I, I heard far more things in the area of food than everything else put together. And it's so important because one of the great things that God has given us is, is be, that we are embodied, that we have physical bodies, and that's not an accident. What I mean by that is Eastern religions will often tell you that the body is at best a necessary evil or something that we seek to escape from or transcend in the next life. Or maybe that you are your soul and your body is just a thing that you pilot around. But that's not Christian doctrine at all. Christian doctrine says that the body is good, that God made the body, he intends us to have the body. It teaches us that Jesus had a body, not only uh, when he first came to earth, but after his resurrection. He was resurrected as a physical being who ate and drank. And we are promised that we will have resurrection bodies as well. Uh, this from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul writes, so it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, but it's raised imperishable. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, and it is raised a spiritual body. Now, we could sit and puzzle about what a spiritual body even means when we think spirit is one thing, body is another. Obviously, it's not that simple. But there's such a thing as a spiritual body that God promises us after the resurrection. So all these things that we enjoy with our bodies, whether it's playing sport or eating ice cream, or the feel of sunshine on the skin, or a hundred other things that our bodies bring to us. Please know that these aren't just accidents about having been dumped in this world. These are things that God intended and designed as blessings for us, as part of his generosity to us, his created beings. Now, I want to make an important distinction. I've been saying that we love God more because of his gifts to us. I want to make it clear, I'm not just talking about the way maybe a very young child will just love a parent because of what they get. I'm not talking about God gives us good things, so in response we love him. That would be a very shallow way to be. What I'm guessing at is more that the gifts of God, as we receive those, show us his character, so we better understand who he is. And that's why we love him more. Uh, let me give you an example um, this sermon turns out to be all about holidays that Fiona and I have been on. But uh, a few years ago, we, we had a short break in Malta. And in the run-up to that, I kept telling Fiona that um, the national dish in Malta is Maltesers. And that that's the only thing they ate out there. Because I love them. And uh, I'll never go and watch a film at the Palace Cinema in Sinderford without getting a, a little bag of Maltesers and taking them in with me. Now, so Fiona, unknown to me, she's sneaked a box of Maltesers into the luggage so that when we got there and we arrived in our hotel room and unpacked, there was this box of Maltesers. Now, on one level, I was just really glad to have the Maltesers because they're tasty, but they meant so much more to me than that because in giving me that gift, Fiona was showing me something about who she is and what she's like, and there's a playfulness and a generosity and a sense of humor and a... a a willingness to buy into my dumb ideas about it being a, the national dish. So the Maltesers meant much more than just a box of delicious little chocolate things. Do you see what I mean? They were a window into the giver of the gift. And that is why God's gifts are so important to us. Because as we partake of these gifts, even what you might think of as very worldly gifts, like a, a curry, that gift is revealing the character of the giver. And that's why they're so valuable. So there's an old hymn that uh, I know in the adaptation of a Phil Keegy song that begins like this. It's very stirring. Rise up, O men of God, have done with lesser things. Give heart and soul and mind and strength to serve the King of Kings. Now, I love this song, but I've always been really uncomfortable with the second line, have done with lesser things. And for a long time, I thought it's because I'm not worthy of that, that line in the song. That I should, if I were a better Christian and I could have done with lesser things and only think about God himself all the time, wouldn't that be better? So that's why that song made me uncomfortable. But I now think it's because that line is not quite right. 
I don't think we are called to have done with lesser things. I think we're called to put them in their right place. So it's not as poetic, but it should go, I would say, rise up, O men of God, think less of lesser things. Or if you're prepared to break the scansion, rise up, O men of God, recognize lesser things as dim reflections of the goodness and kindness of the God who has given them. It's a fairly major rewrite, so I guess we won't do that. But I, I think this is really important. All these lesser things, treated rightly, point us towards the God who has given them. So my call is for us to absolutely enjoy everything good that God gives, but in doing so, to absolutely recognize how very much more good the giver is. You know, I really enjoyed the Maltesers, but Fiona is so much better than the box of Maltesers. And in the same way, I love um, being out in the, in the sunshine. It, it's a wonderful thing. It, it lifts my spirits and warms my body. But it's the giver of that sunshine is worth so, so much more than the sunshine itself. And the same is true of every gift of God. So yes, let's enjoy, but let's also look to the giver. And I want to finish with a, a, a quote from John Piper who uh, in about 12 words said everything that I've said over the last 20 minutes. So if you take nothing else away, take this. We both love God more than we love his gifts, and we love God more because of his gifts. And that's absolutely right. God is the giver of every good gift, and in every good gift, we want to recognize him as the giver. So thank you for listening, and I hope you will enjoy everything you do this afternoon and this evening. Okay. I'll pray. Is that all right? Yeah. Great God, we thank you that you are not only great but also good. And from the bottom of our hearts, we thank you that you've given us these embodied lives on earth with all the pleasures that come from living here on earth. And our prayer now is both that you will enable us to fully enjoy those things without guilt but also to keep second things second and you the first thing, to keep you first, recognizing as we enjoy every gift that you are the giver of that gift, knowing in our hearts who you are, seeing you more clearly as we understand how you show yourself to us in each of those good gifts and drawing closer to you and loving you more deeply because of everything that you've given us. In Jesus' name, we thank you, and we long to come closer to you. Amen.